my heart and bless my soul. Didn't think I'd make it this many years old. There must be someone up above saying, Come on, child. Yours too. Don't know where to go or what to do. Must be somebody up above saying, Come on, child, you got to. Come on up, you gotta hold on. Yes, to me. Oh, oh, hold on. Oh, On this uh, beautiful Sunday morning, muggy, hot, warm, we are, as you may know, if you are living here on the Florida Panhandle or someone close to us, under a tropical storm warning this morning. Yes. Now, it's the first time this has happened in a while. They've come close. <laughs> no clapping, please. No clapping. Uh, they've come close, but this is the first warning that we've had in some time. Uh, if you are concerned about flooding, and maybe you should be, they're talking about maybe a foot of rain even without a direct hit this coming week. There are sandbag stations, two in South Walton and one in Freeport. So if you need any help with that over the days ahead, holler at somebody and we'll try to get some help to you. But time is of the essence. I think we're talking about Monday morning, uh, Monday afternoon maybe, uh, before the bad weather really gets here. So uh, please be aware, and uh, you know, that's how it is. It's 2020, and the week that we're planning to go back to uh, meeting together again could have a hurricane, so that's just how it goes. So uh, that's 2020, ain't it? Ain't it 2020? How's the uh, Amen Sister Friend going? It's good. Thanks for asking. <laughs> I love it. Podcasting is life. <laughs> you really like it? It's, you're finding your way, figuring yes, some things out? Yes, I really like it. You know, uh, we were talking earlier, but, you know, I think it's just showing up. And every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, I have an episode. So even though I feel like I'm doubting myself a little bit, but I'm just like, you know what? Keep showing up and keep doing it, and it'll all fall into place, and nothing's on a timeline. Just doing what I love to do and sharing in important conversations. Maybe maybe, maybe this uh, maybe this music today and this talk is just for you then to encourage you. Uh, maybe I'm really so. excited about about today. Uh, <laughs> well, it is about her. Look at her. She's sitting. She. Tim. I mean, I can I can at least talk her. to her. You, you got your own. You got your own Tim, camera. Tim's like, look at me. Uh, Tim's got his own camera. You know, Everybody and he's got his own. Tim. He's got his own soundboard now. And when we go back to the church, we're moving the drums back to the center of the stage. I don't know what he wants. More. <laughs> More Tim. More Tim Kim. Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find.
Have you sang that one before here? I feel oh. like I have. I don't know. I can't remember that one. Yeah. It's well, since song. we're giving every all the attention to Sarah and Tim, I don't want to forget Ricky back here. <laughs> Ricky has a brand new bass. And it's, P, it's a it, P Ricky. bass, and it's like Motown old school. One single pickup, not that that matters to anybody out there. Uh, I mean, it, it is, and Sarah's got a phone ringing. Phone's ringing. And uh, Ricky's playing later today at Stinky's. Is that right, Stinky's? Bluegrass... Uh, He's got a bluegrass festival going on right there in the dining room, and I think they've been really good about mask and social distancing. I think it's a, it's a safe place to go there. Uh, it's Bill. That's what I'm saying. It's Bill Monroe's birthday, and Ricky's upset with me that we don't have a Bill Monroe song today. But Ricky will play a bunch of Bill Monroe today at Stinky's if you want to hear that. Are they streaming that too? I think. Oh yes, sir. Good deal. Brian Wise. Too. Brian Wise? But not Brian, Brian but not Brian <laughs> not White. Brian White. Brian Wise. This is a requested song. I will rise from the ashes, rise. The trouble I found and the rubble on the ground, I'll rise. I will rise from the ashes, rise. From the trouble I found and the rubble on the ground, I'll rise. Because he who is in me is greater than I will ever be, and I will rise. Because he in me is greater than I will ever be and I will rise. Sometimes my heart's on the ground and hope is nowhere to be found. Love is a figment I once knew. Trouble I found in the rubble on the ground, I'll rise. I'll rise from the ashes, rise. From the rubble I found in the rubble on the ground, I'll rise. Cause he who is in me is greater than I will ever be, and I will rise. Because he Coming to this place that I don't know, I don't know how to face. So I laid down my life in hopes to find that somehow, someday, I will rise. I will rise from the ashes, rise from the trouble I. Ashes rise from the trouble I found and the rubble on the ground. I'll rise because he who is in me is greater than I will ever be, and I will rise because he who is in me is greater than I will ever be. Cause he who is in me is greater than I will ever be and I will rise. Sean, Sean McDonald. So this is a song that I, I really thought Sarah would love, but she doesn't like it. <laughs> Very hard to sing. Only because it's hard to sing. It's not a bad song. Yeah, it's a, it's a great song. I actually adore the song. It's 
more like my skill singing the song. <laughs> you know, there's, so, there's a lot of songs you're like, man, that is so great. And then you try to sing it and you're like, holy cow. Yeah, <laughs> that I know. It's really tough. Yeah. Uh, and it's one of those songs just like I tried to hand off uh, yesterday to Nick. <laughs> that I actually handed this song off to Sarah because I was like, I just don't have the range for this song. But maybe Sarah does. And now Sarah hates me and never wants to sing this <laughs> song again. <laughs> so we're doing this in E, right? Uh, well, yes. You go before I know that you've even gone to win my war. Your love becomes my grave. From the dry wilderness, you go before I know that you've even gone to win my war. Your love becomes my greatest defense. It's me from the dry. All I did was pray All I did was worship All I did was bow down oh, All I did was stay still Stay still
That's fantastic. <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> I did not. I did not know how we were going to end that. Oh, that was great. I (laughs) I really just dropped into that. I I just love the fact that she was dreading that, and she slayed it. Uh, This is coming to you, Anna, Anna Balfour, with our scripture reading today from Genesis 41. Anna, take it away. What are your dreams like these days? I wonder if they have masks in them yet. Are you taking time to pay attention to what is in them? Are they speaking to you? Well, today's continuation of the Joseph story in Genesis 44 centers again around dreams that needed to be looked at and taken note of in significant ways for the good of everyone. Two full years later, Pharaoh dreamed that he was standing on the bank of the Nile River. In his dream, he saw seven fat, healthy cows come out of the river and begin grazing in the marsh grass. Then he saw seven more cows come up behind them from the Nile, but these were scrawny and thin. These cows stood beside the fat cows on the riverbank. Then the scrawny thin cows ate the seven healthy fat cows. At this point in the dream, Pharaoh woke up, but he fell asleep again and had a second dream. This time, he saw seven heads of grain, plump and beautiful, growing on a single stalk. Then seven more heads of grain appeared, but these were shriveled and withered by the east wind. And these thin heads swallowed up the seven plump, well-formed heads. Then Pharaoh woke up again and realized it was a dream. The next morning, Pharaoh was very disturbed by the dream, so he called for all the magicians and wise men of Egypt. When Pharaoh told them his dreams, not one of them could tell him what they meant. Finally, the king's chief cupbearer spoke up. Today I've been reminded of my failure, he told Pharaoh. Some time ago you were angry with the chief baker and me and you imprisoned us in the palace of the captain of the guard. One night the chief baker and I each had a dream and each dream had its own meaning. There was a young Hebrew man with us in the prison who was a slave of the captain of the guard. We told him our dreams and he told us what each of our dreams meant. Pharaoh sent for Joseph at once and he was quickly brought from the prison. After he had shaved and changed his clothes, he went in and stood before Pharaoh. This will happen just as I have described it. For God has revealed to Pharaoh in advance what he is about to do. The next seven years will be a period of great prosperity throughout the land of Egypt, but afterward there will be a seven years of famine so great that all the prosperity will be forgotten in Egypt. Famine will destroy the land. This famine will be so severe that even the memory of the good years will be erased. As for, ha- as for having two similar dreams, It means that these events have been decreed by God and he will soon make them happen. Therefore, Pharaoh should find an intelligent and wise man and put him in charge of the entire land of Egypt. Joseph's suggestions were well received by Pharaoh and his officials. So Pharaoh asked his officials, can we find anyone else like this man, so obviously filled with the spirit of God Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has revealed the meaning of the dreams to you, clearly no one else is as intelligent or wise as you are. You will be in charge of my court and all my people will take orders from you. Only I, sitting on my throne, will have a rank higher than yours. Pharaoh said to Joseph, I hereby put you in charge of the entire land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh removed his signet ring from his hand and placed it on Joseph's finger. He dressed him in fine linen clothing and hung a gold chain around his neck. Then he had Joseph ride in the chariot, reserved for his second in command. And wherever Joseph went, the command was shouted, kneel down. So Pharaoh put Joseph in charge of all Egypt. And Pharaoh said to him, I am Pharaoh, 
but no one will lift a hand or foot in the entire land of Egypt without your approval. The peace of the Lord be with us all.
I'm holding Pretty good hit. Good job, y'all. They go. Yeah, give them a minute. So here are two statements today, and both of them are true. Number one, you have almost no control over what happens to you in your life. Two, you are the only one who can take responsibility for your own life. Here are two statements. Both of them are true. One, you have almost no control over what happens to you in your life. And two, you are the only one who can take responsibility for your own life. And with these two statements, two examples, the first is macro, large, the second maybe closer to home. Mount Pinatubo is an active volcano in the Philippines. <clears throat> Its last major eruption was in the summer of 1991, and it was indeed major. Pinatubo, Pinatubo was the second largest volcanic eruption in the entire 20th century. And today, so much of the epic volcanic film footage that we see, the explosive power, the pyrotechnic flows, are from that particular eruption. It spewed ash afterwards for four months. It created a two-mile crater that quickly collapsed into a volcanic caldera lake, and it displaced a quarter of a million people and killed about 200 people. An aboriginal tribe that lived on that mountainside for centuries was especially devastated. The name of that tribe is the Etas. Pinatobo was more than their home. It was their destiny, they said. So after the eruption, the Filipino government planned to build new settlements and to permanently relocate the Etas for their own safety. But against the instructions of all the geologists, against all the scientists, and against the Filipino authorities, they returned to the mountain. And they so dug in their roots back into that mountainside that in 2009, the Filipino governor, government finally just gave them a certificate of ownership which is something that an aboriginal tribe rarely, if ever, gets. But it really wasn't a success. It was doomsday. They felt so drawn back to the mountain that this was the mountain that had birthed them in their own theology, that they had to leave there, and it was, had to leave there, and it was inescapable. They could never depart. They had to stay. And sooner rather than later, that mountain will erupt again. And that entire tribe will be in danger of extinction, but they cannot seem to escape. Now, let's not pick on them too quick. Because in my own heritage, and maybe not so much Garrett's, because Garrett is from the Midwest and understands Tornado Alley very well, but Bobby and I, both raised in the deep south, deep south, we had our own what, what was called at the time, though I don't think it's particularly correct anymore to call it Dixie Alley through Alabama and North Georgia. There was this phenomenon in the 20th century, particularly in the early 20th century, where this same sensation of doom held over Southerners, particularly religious Southerners. There are massive studies from last century where when a tornado warning was issued, there were more deaths in the South than there were in the Midwest and in the North. Not because the construction of our homes was worse, but because Southerners had this sort of Christian-esque fatalism that if it was your time to go, then brother, it's your time to go. And so a tornado warning would sound, and they would just drop to their knees there and pray in the kitchen and hope that things turned out all right. When the tornado warn sounded in Nebraska or Oklahoma or in Iowa, they went to the storm shelter. They got out of the way. And it took decades, decades for this to loosen up 
were that finally people would not just simply have faith, but they would have faith enough to get out of the way of obvious trouble. A second example. You know I have three sons, and the older two are adopted. I think Garrett's showing you a lovely picture taken by Lynn Crow of my three boys. It's a little outdated already, even though it was just taken last year, because I assure you Blaze McBrayer's hair is not that long any longer. I used to tell my two oldest boys that being adopted is a lot like carrying a book bag to school. When you're young, the pack is small and it is light. And as you get older and as you get stronger and as you get more mature, you can carry more. You can carry more of your story. You can carry more of the emotional weight of your origins, more of the information and tools that you need that will round you out as a person. And I would also say that it's yours, this backpack is yours to keep. You are an adult until you are older and can handle it. You have to trust me on how much weight is going to be put into that backpack. I'll give you all that you can carry one day but I'm going to give it to you in little pieces so that you can grow into it. And I would say, as it is for all of us, sons, you had no control whatsoever, no say-so over how you entered this world or became a part of this family. But you are now the only one who decides what to do with it. Here are two statements. Both of these are true. You have almost no control over what happens to you in your life. Two, you are the only one who can take responsibility for your own life. You may have inherited an ancestral home on the side of a deadly volcano. <laughs> that wasn't your doing. All right, we got the audio back. Sorry about that for just a second. We might edit this out. We might not. We'll probably just let it roll, okay? Uh, many of us maintain this kind of blind fatalism. At least many people I know have this blind fatalism. When their world collapses, they resign themselves to a life of misery. They're just waiting for the other shoe to drop. They give up. This is my fate. This is my end. This is the one and only path destined for me. I'm powerless. I'm trapped. I'm a victim. There's no way out. You have almost no control over what happens to you in your life, but you are the only one who can take responsibility for your life. When we were last with Joseph, and if you haven't been listening to this series, you can catch up on Facebook video or YouTube or my podcast. When we were last with Joseph in prison, why? His brothers had sold him into slavery out of murderous envy and told their father that Joseph was dead. He arrived in Egypt, was purchased as a household slave, was falsely accused of sexual assault. Now he's in prison, and he has met these two other prisoners that were well-connected. He, the dreamer, interpreted their dreams for them, and one of the men, Pharaoh's cup bear the butler for the palace would soon be acquitted of any crime and we would, would be restored to his old job and joseph makes a simple request of him when you get out of here and you get back to the palace tell somebody about me so that i can get out of here that's where we were last week we talked about joseph and his past was it joseph's fault for being his father's favorite son 
Was it Joseph's fault for having big dreams as a kid, resulting in his brothers hating him? No. Did Joseph sell himself into slavery? Did Joseph wake up in prison? No. He has had zero. It keeps coming kind of now. I can unplug it from here. Factory is going dead. Check, check. We can try it, yeah. All right, we're just going to go with the uh, audio from the iPad. So if we can boost the volume, I'll turn that around. And we'll, we'll, we'll be fine with that. I don't know exactly where the audio cut out, so let me just repeat myself right there. Was it Joseph's fault for being his father's favorite? No. Was it Joseph's fault for having big dreams as a kid, resulting in his brothers hating him? No. Did Joseph sell himself into slavery? No. Did Joseph wake up in prison one day because of the choices that he had made? No. Everything that has happened to Joseph up to this point has been largely and completely out of his control. And then, for today's text, we open up with a, with a line that should make your blood run cold. Anna read it for us. Two full years later, later, Pharaoh dreamed that he was standing on the bank of the Nile River. One chapter ago, last Sunday, one chapter, but for Joseph, two years have passed since the reading last week and the reading this week. And Joseph has been in prison this entire time. The cupbearer got his fancy job back in the palace and forgot all about poor Joseph. Again, this was something beyond Joseph's ability to control. Now, I'll make my own confession here. If I was Joseph at this point in time in the story, I think I'd quit. I, I think I would, I, I would be done. For the first time in over a decade, there is a chance that life will finally swing his way. The cupbearer will tell my story to the king. I will get busted out of here. I'll go back home and I'll kick the, my brother's sorry behinds who caused all of this to happen. And then a day passes and two days passes and three days pass. No word from the cupbearer. Then it becomes a week. Then it becomes a month. Then it becomes a year. And Joseph knows that he has been forgotten in prison. And honestly, you know what I would be doing? I'd be taking that Egyptian linen that's covering my bedside and I'd be making a noose. I would be ready to check out of that place because of the injustice that he has suffered. He's no longer a teenager. He's now 30 years old and he has spent half of his life as a slave or as a prisoner. But then what happens? Pharaoh has a set of crazy dreams about fat and skinny cows and about bursting heads of grain and poor empty pods of grain. He's off his rocker with anxiety and finally, hey, thanks pal, finally the cupbearer remembers Joseph and says to Pharaoh, oh my gosh, there is this Hebrew kid back in jail, and he told me my dream, and it all came true. I'm sure this is the guy that can help you, and what does Pharaoh do? Go get me Joseph right now and bring him here. From the prison to the palace. I love a story that Sonny Jurgensen would tell about himself. Jurgensen is in the National Football League Hall of Fame he was quarterback for both Philadelphia and Washington back in the 50s, the 60s, and the 70s. Old school, he was tough. He set or broke all kinds of records. Some still stand to this day, even the way the game has evolved. Uh, he was a pro bowler five different times. Vince Lombardi said that Sonny was the greatest, purest passer to ever play the game. And if he had had Jurgensen on his team, the Packers would have never lost a single game. That's quite a compliment. He was beloved, but he was also hated at times because Sonny was one of those rare quarterbacks that got to call his own plays. He was sort of the coach on the field. 
and sometimes he would call a play and it would go horrendously bad. And the coaching staff would be on him and the fans would be booing him. Well, a reporter came up to him one time and said, and by this time, Jerkinson was over 40, still playing the game, had it all his teeth hit front knocked out. And a reporter asked him and said, you know, Sonny, does it hurt your feelings when the fans start booing you like they do? And he gave a smile, no teeth. And he said, no, not really. I don't want to quit. And he said this, I've been in the game long enough to know that every quarterback, every week of the season, spends his time either in the penthouse or in the outhouse and ain't it the truth. For more than a dozen years, Joseph has been in the outhouse. No control whatsoever. But with a single summons from Pharaoh, Joseph walks into the palace of the most powerful man in the world. And the amazing thing is, he shows up looking nothing like a victim. Nothing like a broken man who had given up. But what's the biggest job interview of his life? An interview with the Pharaoh of Egypt. And he has everything against him. He's, he's young. He's a foreigner. He has no government experience. He has a shady past. He has a prison record. If he messes it up, he won't be going back to jail. He'll probably be going to the guillotine and we'll, it'll be off with his head. But he shaves off the beard that he's been growing there in prison. He changes his clothes. He slicks back his hair. And he walks into that palace ready for this opportunity. Pharaoh tells Joseph his dreams. Joseph interprets these dreams. The dreaming gift has never left this young man. And, and there's going to be a great season of boom, Joseph tells Pharaoh. It's going to last seven years. And this is going to be followed by seven years of famine. Egypt survived on two little narrow strips of land. The Nile River, every season, would flood. And it would begin in the late summer and would go all the way into winter, the monsoon season. The rain wouldn't be falling in Egypt. Egypt only gets two inches of rain a year. The rain was falling in the heart of Africa. And it was swelling the Nile River and the Nile would then proceed north into Egypt and it would flood. And as the Nile River would flood, it would flood both sides of the riverbanks. And what was just sand and couldn't grow anything suddenly had all this silt this rich, dark, black earth from the heart of Africa on it, and wherever there was a flood, the Egyptian farmers could farm and sustain their country. So what Joseph is saying is this. For seven years, the flood is going to be massive. There's going to be rich, deep, dark earth brought here to the Egyptian heart, heartland. The boom is going to be so strong, you better save everything that you can because then there's going to be seven years of drought. This is going to be seven years where you won't be able to harvest anything. And so what Egypt needs, Mr. Pharaoh, is a master plan for the coming crisis, and it needs a masterful person to be in charge of this masterful plan in order to save the country, yea, save half the world from starvation. Well, what does Pharaoh say? Can we find anyone else like this man so obviously filled with the Spirit of God? Since God has revealed the meaning of this dream to you, clearly no one else is as intelligent or wise as you are. You will be in charge of my court. All my people will take orders from you. Only I, sitting on my throne, will have a rank higher than yours. I hereby put you in charge of the entire land of Egypt. And just like that, Joseph takes the elevator out of the outhouse up to the penthouse. He has gone from London Tower to Buckingham Palace. He has gone from Alcatraz or Leavenworth to the White House in a single moment. But it was not instantaneous, was it? Joseph has been prepared for this moment. Forced to live as a slave and as a prisoner, he now has compassion, no doubt, for those who suffer. In Potter's first house in prison, he picks up the language and the customs of Egypt. He interacts with political prisoners, learning from their mistakes. He learns administrative skills because he's always rising to the top to be in charge. It's been an agonizing process, but preparation is always a painful process. And Joseph is, has this uniquely crafted experience that has equipped him. He is the right place. He is in the right place at the right time, and he is the right man because he has not wasted his time. He has had no control 
over any of his circumstances, but he is a person that has taken full responsibility for his own life and what he could do in the face of these circumstances. So, you feel like maybe you were born into the wrong family. <laughs> Sometimes we have that feeling. Well, you can't do anything about that. You can only do something about what is next. You've lost a job and it wasn't your fault. Maybe it was somebody else's fault. Maybe it's downsizing. Maybe it's the coronavirus. It wasn't your fault and now you're without a job. You can't do anything about that. But you can do something about what is next. So you say you've been cheated on. You've been mistreated. You've been pushed around, knocked around. You can't do anything about what has happened to you. But you can do something about what is next. You think you inherited a spot on the top of a volcano about to explode. You think you're living in some kind of tornado alley where there's a warning going off all the time. You can't do anything about that. You can only do something about what is next. That choice is yours, and it's only yours to make. Here's the final story. Uh, Ronald Reagan grew up in a small town in northern Illinois. Very poor. His father, Jack, uh, was a salesman, but being a good Irishman couldn't stop telling stories long enough to actually sell anything, it seemed. And President Reagan's aunt was visiting one day and observed the poverty that her nephews were living in. In post haste, she took young Ron to a cobbler, to a shoemaker, to have him a pair of shoes made. This is back in the day when you didn't order anything on Amazon. And the shoemaker asked Ronald Reagan, this would have been like in 1920, the shoemaker asked Ronald Reagan this, do you want square toes on these shoes or rounded toes on these shoes? And I was raised poor, and poor kids usually have never been given much of an opportunity to make their own decisions. And Ron had not been given many opportunities to make a decision. He couldn't decide. He said to the shoemaker, I don't know. And the shoemaker said, all right, you come back in a couple weeks and tell me. A couple weeks pass, and the shoemaker's out one day going to his shop, and he sees Ron Reagan playing in the streets with some other kids. And he says, hey, you haven't told me yet what type of shoes you want, round toes or square toes. And Ron, Ron Reagan says, I don't know. I can't decide. And the shoemaker said, very well. Well, he went and got his shoes a couple weeks later, Shoemaker brought them out. One had a round toe and one had a square toe. And Reagan was like, what is this? And the shoemaker said this to me. Let this be a lesson. If you don't make your own decisions, somebody else will make those decisions for you. And that is exactly what will happen if you relinquish the responsibility you have for your own life, life will simply happen to you. And you will awaken one day at 50, 60, 70, 80 years of age to realize that you weren't going with the flow. You gave your life, your one and only life, over to circumstances or to others for them to manage it for you. But if you're listening today, then today you can still take responsibility for your own decisions in your own God-given life. This prayer seems like the best conclusion today. You will recognize the first paragraph. I hope you will hear it all in full. May we pray. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardship as the pathway to peace, 
taking as Jesus did this sinful world just as it is, not as I would have it, trusting that you will make all things right if I surrender to your will so that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with you forever and ever in the next. In Jesus' name. Are we unmuted? Ready to roll? Sorry about those uh, little glitches, uh, but we hopefully won't have to worry about this next week. <laughs> so as a reminder, next week we'll be back uh, together, together again for the first time in over six months. And we will give it a try, 9 o'clock and 10.30. 9 o'clock and 10.30, we'll have some uh, changes in our seating. We'll have plenty of cleaning supplies. Please wear a mask. Uh, you know... Uh, you, you, you may be one of the folks who feel like, I ah, just not, you know, you can't. Listen, do it for somebody else. It's not about you. It's not about me. If you come by yourself, keep a little distance. If you come with your family, sit comfortably with your family as you normally would, and we will try to work this through together and hopefully avoid uh, uh, any further outbreak this winter. So that's next Sunday back at the church. Look forward to see you then. Our services will be uh, recorded and will be posted later. So if we have picked you up, one of the several hundred that we've picked up uh, over these last six months, we're certainly not forgetting you. We're going to try to be good stewards of, uh, of your watching as well and keep you up to date. Uh, Ricky is heading off to uh, Stinky's. Uh, Kurt Tape is heading off on a motorcycle, motorcycle ride uh, toward New Orleans and I hope he knows there's a hurricane coming. They'll probably pray for him. And then he's heading on out west. I hope he knows there's a lot of fire out there. Uh, so let's remember him. And, and let's do remember folks out west. Uh, the western United States is burning to the ground. It is just insane. So remember these folks. Natural disasters everywhere. Coronavirus is 2020. Who, who sent the meme this morning? 13... 13 says, I'm the worst number, and then 666 six, six says, no, I am, and then 2020 just laughs at him. So, <laughs> yeah. I got to remember how.
See you next Sunday.